Welcome back to Nail Babe Pod, a podcast dedicated to interviewing the nail babes of the nail world. I'm your host, Abe the Nail Babe. I'm a full time content creator, nail fluencer. Is that a thing? Can we call it that? <laughs> Cat dad and podcaster, of course. I feel like this podcast has become the unofficial water cooler talk of the nail community. <laughs> Many of the guests I've had on so far are full time content creators. And it's kind of lonely. We're just painting our nails alone in our houses, but we are each other's coworkers. So you're getting to hear the gossip at the water cooler. I don't know why I'm saying water cooler. Like I've worked a corporate job. I don't know. Is that a thing still? <laughs> Everyone just works on Zoom, I guess. Anyway, this week, my nail babe is Ash from Parabell Beauty. She is a TikToker and a nail health DIYer. We'll get into her story and how she ended up where she did but it really was a response to her audience. She says, people were asking me questions and I decided to answer. If you're not sure what to post, ask your audience. Sometimes they're right, sometimes I just don't wanna do what they tell me to do. <laughs> so without any further ado, lotion those hands and oil your cuticles and welcome Ash to the pod. I am so excited to welcome Ash from Parabell Beauty. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. We've been messaging for a while, but like finally found the scheduling. But your niche is kind of like education, right? I feel like you are yeah. very big on TikTok. I feel like when I created my TikTok, my nail TikTok, you were like, all the videos were you. You're just like popping up me like, hey guys, here's the problem. Like, I don't know. If you're anything like me, I don't know, with your like beautiful, natural long nails. Yes. I have a very basic nail veil. See it, but it's like very neutral, basic swimming. I have my like reflective blue and then nude, <laughs> just nothing else on the other. <laughs> Honestly, we all have a content hand. Like, I think that's what like it makes like content, like nail content. Like, I have a content hand. Like, there's one hand I film everything with, and one hand that's almost never in a video. So, yeah. yeah. It's just so much harder to film the other one. I'm like, everything, I have to like change all the light and like the phone, and I just like can't see. And just like, and whenever I show that hand, I'm like embarrassed because I don't take as good care of it. <laughs> I don't know if you, like, take as good care of your other hand as well. I feel like with my other hands, like, I kind of like to leave it alone a little bit because, like, I sometimes, like, it's, like, I have to have, like, one hand available to do content with, but also to test different things because, like, what makes things, like, so, so like, really interesting is that people use products in different ways and sometimes right. they'll ask about how to use a product in a way that I don't use it. So I always have to have a free hand available to film content film different things and test different things because some people be like oh well this really works for me or that doesn't work or like have you ever thought about using it this way so like this is my content slash testing hand and this one is like my stable one so <laughs> mm, okay yeah that is like yeah I'm like I don't want to test something on my good hand like what if <laughs> what if something happens <laughs> what if I break a nail <laughs> but so I feel like you, but you've positioned yourself. I mean, a lot of your videos are basically like educating people about nail care, teaching them how to like grow their nails, right? You also have a blog that you yes. <laughs> write a bunch of like articles basically, right? Yes. What like made you, or how did you fall into that niche, I guess? That's the perfect way to describe it, fall into it. Um, yeah. Because it wasn't like this intentional decision to be like, oh, you know, I want to specialize in nail care, nail health. So yeah, so essentially like um, backstory, um, undergrad, MIT, mathematical economics, that was really intense. Um, even if you, regardless of like what major you pick, like you still have to do like the technicals. So like physics killed me. <laughs> <laughs> like physics was a killer. Um, real analysis, don't ask me about what that is. Um, but it was just like, it was a really academically challenging environment. Obviously, you know, I'm really grateful for it. I learned a lot. I mean, MIT, that's like, <laughs> that's super intense. Definitely, like, transitioning from, like, an all-girls, like, Catholic oh, okay. school to, like, oh. go, like, a tech school was, like, really, like, massive. Where are you from? Uh, Jersey. Okay. Oh, okay. As I was sort of starting my freshman year, um, there was definitely, like, imposter syndrome was definitely, like, the mm. biggest thing. I realized that there was some gaps in some of my uh, understanding of STEM physics. You can just pretty much say I did not have a physics background. And, yeah, it was, like, really challenging. And I realized that... You know, throughout my freshman year, part of the challenge wasn't just the academic challenge, but like so much of my identity was tied to my academic performance. Mm -hmm. And once there were like a lot of fluctuations in my academic, well, not fluctuations, just like 
just like really well performance. Like that really definitely it was like it definitely like shook me. Like I, I know people like oh you know which is a great like get over it, but like when your self worth is tied to your performance, it was definitely a really challenging time. But throughout a lot of the academic challenge, like nail art has was my therapy, right? Um, cute polish is really big inspiration and I'm sure like the white background the real like straightforward like that is definitely what so much of my content style is based on now that you say it I definitely see the influence just like very clear like perfect like voiceover like I see the inspiration (laughs) yeah so definitely like I would you know watch so many of her tutorials and you just do like uh, nail art I would post I have a personal Instagram which is ironic that I don't I've not posted it on it in like three years like I don't personally like Instagram but (laughs) At the time, I was actually posting like different like nail art, right? So I had like a Tiffany's box design. I had, and I would like do like, oh, you know, breakfast anyone? These like really sort of like cute captions. Um, that was like always like sort of like my thing. Um, and as I like start getting to like sophomore and like junior year, I didn't actually have as much time for nail art, but I was just focusing on actually knowing how to paint my nails nicely because like I would do nail art, but like my my lines were so messy. It was just like. It was such a mess, right? Well, when you first start, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> or no, yeah. you don't know what a cleanup brush is. Like, you don't. <laughs> For sure. It was just a, it was just kind of like a mess. But um, what I love so much about nail art wasn't that it was just therapeutic, but it gave me a lot of clarity and connection, you know, especially being more on the introverted side, like kind of quiet. If I didn't necessarily find the words to know how to say something, my hands would do the talking. And there were so many people, like, I would go to, like, let's say the cafeteria or I'd go to, like, the cafe. And, you know, people who worked there would always ask me what I planned on doing with, with my nails this week or, like, what I was doing with it. So it just allowed me to really connect and talk with people otherwise. And you know, I wouldn't necessarily talk to just because I'd, like, sort of keep to myself. But, yeah, people would come to my room. I'd do my uh, nail art for my friends. And then as I like moved on, I started doing like a lot of events because initially I wanted to do like a nail art club. So, you know, I sort of came to them with this sort of like a uh, nail art wellness type event. And they're like, absolutely. That sounds really cool. They were super supportive. So I had like nail polish and Netflix night, popping polish, which it was like boba and nail art. On the ba- So on the back end, I was, you know, doing that. I was also working as a social media marketer for like the career center so i was you know doing stuff but i didn't really have like a fundamental understanding of social media i was just sort of like posting nice things i was getting a sense of what people like were responding to and weren't responding to i feel like we have a similar i also i work for the admissions uh, department at my university and like i ran their like social media and like i made like them like flyers and like all sorts of stuff so like i feel like we have a similar um experience in college also going i want to go back to the imposter syndrome mm-hmm. thing because i definitely had that at cornell too where like you're coming from like you're like the best in your high school or like you know you're the top whatever but then you like go to this university like the top in the country and like now everybody was the top in their high school coming to here so then you're like wait a minute like that is <laughs> what's going on <laughs> uh, for sure no it was yeah. like it was, I felt like when I originally got into like MIT, obviously my mom like pushed me to apply. But if it wasn't for her, I would never have applied to be quite honest. Um, but you know, when I initially got in, I was really excited, but I think that the imposter syndrome kicked in even before I went there. Cause I was mm-hmm. like, how did I even like get into this place? So I never like really went to like initially into MIT being like, you know what? I know I'm going to be the smartest person. I was like, what am I even like doing here? Um, I also just Mm. didn't have any sort of clarity in terms of what I wanted to do. And I was constantly, you know, seeing how amazing everyone else was, but not acknowledging any of my own skills. I'm curious if that feeling imposter syndrome translates to this nail world in i know a lot of times like if my videos aren't performing well or like whatever like sometimes it's like oh no like a minute that come that feeling comes back and it's like whoa what i'm not good like i shouldn't be like you know i don't know if you still have that yeah for me because not as bad as it used to be but definitely like i am not the best watcher and i'm not my nail art is questionable i mean your lines are so beautiful i first saw your contacts like oh my i thought you were i thought you were like a professional like nail type i was like oh my goodness <laughs> the swatching videos i'm like uh, you know well, you don't you don't do a lot of swatching videos really not at all yeah. right so sometimes i'm like when i do them which i don't i've pretty much not done them in like months i don't even i can't remember a lot i think i did like some nail art on pinterest like recently but like i'm like whoa there's a difference here <laughs> 
But um, <laughs> I think that, you know, I, my mindset has changed a lot in terms of like how I view myself. I know when a video un- underperforms, it's not ideal. However, if it serves someone, I think that's the most important thing. So like, even if it gets one, two comments and someone's like, oh my goodness, thank you. This really helps solve my problem or I love your videos. That's really like what matters. I think initially, I'm not going to lie. When I first got into the TikTok game, I was on, I was definitely hooked to the whole virality bug, but like now, not so much. And I'm, I'm more concerned about the impact the video makes, Mm -hmm. even if it changes one person or helps them solve, you know, one person solve a problem. That's what matters. But definitely in the early days, it was like, I want every video to get 50,000, 100,000 views, et cetera. But I'm so glad I'm over that because it's just, it's not a great feeling. And there's so many factors that contribute to virality that are not always in control. It ultimately has to be a combination of what you're making and what TikTok wants to push out. Everyone says, oh, it doesn't matter, whatever. But it does, like they have an objective. Definitely two years ago, they just want to get people on the platform and keep them there. So it was all about retention. Now they're really in their monetization phase. So it's like, how do we make money? That's why you're going to see the TikTok shop videos really being pushed. Um, right now, I think TikTok is, I say it's in this retro era because the fact that Tube Girl and um, TikTok shop is what's being pushed, that's almost akin to the trending sounds and small business TikTok that was really blowing up two years ago. But that seems to be like where their objective is. So, yeah. Mm. I think that is a good reframe, though, of what the objective of a video is. Like, is the objective just to, like, get a million views? Or is it actually to help educate people and teach people? Like, that is what <laughs> your bio and, like, every uh, video, you're like, I help thousands of you, like, grow your nails. Like, that is the goal of your page. So, like, if people are getting value out of it, then that's a success. So yes. I think going back and like same for me, a lot of times like my videos, I'm like, was the, I'm just painting my nail. Like, is that like providing value? It's like, well, I mean, there's just inspiration to paint your nail. Like that can be the value. It doesn't have to be some like crazy, you know, feature length film <laughs> that I'm posting. You know, it's not about that. And it's just about my creativity and expressing myself. But I did want to go back to how you even started TikTok. I asked people to give us their Sparknote versions about how they got into online or nail polish, Simply Nail Logical, COVID boredom, and self-expression. So aesthetic, clarity, and connection. So clarity, um, especially when obviously having that just transition to like MIT and being rough, it wasn't just like a loss of academic performance at the time, but also a loss of self, right? Because I always identified mm. as this type of student. So it's honestly a healthy transition, but like going from that to me, now I'm a nail person. Great. I'm a nail person. It was like some level of clarity, uh, which again, in retrospect, that's not necessarily a healthy mindset shift. So you essentially like you're just rebranding the same problem, but I moved out of that. And in terms of aesthetic, I mean, like having nails that like look good is just like, it's always, a, it's always a plus. So then are you like, you're doing like nail art and you're inviting people to your dorm or <laughs> your room. And then when does the TikTok or like social media come okay. in? So in March 2021, we are all sent home. Did I say March 2021? Yeah, we went home March 2020. Yeah. Oh, so 2020. Yes. I'm messing up my dates here. It was like a fever dream. I saw like other students, you know, blowing up on TikTok kind of with signs and things like that. And I was really fascinated how they were just sharing their interests, right? That would be cool to like, you know, share some things I learned about nails, just like share my journey. I was not even being serious. But then what ended up happening was I posted like a few videos and they really start to like pop off and I'm like what what made it so interesting it wasn't that the videos were doing well it was all the questions associated with them right it wasn't just like oh okay you know thanks or like great it was like everyone was asking me all these questions about their nails nail biting nail this nail that and I'm like I like is it like who's like the nail like I just posted three videos, but it was like all of these questions, right? So I was like, you know what? People were asking it, so I'm just going to continue making more videos. So for a good like few months, like all of my videos were just based on people's questions, right? I feel like that's good though on TikTok. That's like really like creates that community. Like I feel like that does well on TikTok, which like I struggle with. <laughs> I struggle with TikTok. Honestly, I'm like, teach me how to TikTok. Cause like you are very big on TikTok and like it does seem like you I guess you, like you said, you just kind of like fell into this like education, which like makes sense. You're following what people are asking. Did you already know these things? And they're asking about like picking your nails. Like, are you doing like research? You're like, let me figure this out. Like, I'm not 100% sure. Let me figure this out. That's what was happening. But um, on the back end, like I would always, I, would, I was working on like different like projects and little things with nails. So like I, 
already, you know, was interviewing people for like different questions and etc. Um, so I never like when I was doing like the research, it wasn't just like, okay, you know, let me just, you know, look at this or look at that. It was like sort of the MIT problem solving way, right? So it was right. like what why are, you know, why are you doing this? Like what's like the cause and like the problem? Let me figure out why this isn't working and I'll like throw something out and people be like, that's not working. This is not working, right? So I kept on like iterating, iterating to try to figure out what would work. But yeah, it was definitely when I went into it, it was by no means was I like this like the nail care go to. I was just like playing around and kind of just like hopping. I was like, yo, let me just sort of step into this. It was definitely a lot of just being there for my audience, like there by their side. People would, you know message me or they had like comment being like thank you so much like this work and I'm like I you know it was like so wild to me because I didn't really think that my content was making that much of an impact I was I just thought okay but yeah so a lot of it was just me quote unquote being in the sandbox you know playing around figuring things out but obviously now you know I do a lot more research why certain things work for some people they don't work for others at the end of the day you know I didn't look at myself as an healthcare person but you know what people were asking me questions so I just decided to answer them so well no, for sure. And like, I think a lot of the stuff that once you're in this nail community, like nail oil or like using a glass file, like all these things that like we take for granted because we have been watching Cute Polish or Simply or being in this community that we share information, we take that for granted as stuff that's like commonly known, which is not. Like people don't know these things. <laughs> so like we need someone like you to like teach people to like take care of their nails. Like if they want nice nails, they have to take care of them. For sure. I feel like also you have a very like strong style in your content. Like I feel like you've found the formula to like what you like. I'm wondering if that was something that you immediately had or you developed. When I originally started, I actually didn't use my voice. It was a robot voice. It was, you know, that classic TikTok, like do this and that really like robotic voice that everyone loved. And then they switched to Barbie voice, which everyone hated. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was pretty much not at all showing up in my content. At the time, I had a TikTok coach and he was like, you know what, right now, like, because you have no presence in your content, because there's not even a voice, people aren't necessarily going to resonate with you. They're just going to see a video. So he encouraged mm -hmm. me to start using my voiceovers because I know, like, I don't know, I always, I don't really like the sound of my voice, but I think that's like a thing that everyone sort of struggles with. But then I got used to it. Content, it's just a cycle. Like, no one has long-term success with those type of videos. Like, you can, like, start off that way, but, like, everyone sort of pivots somehow. So I knew it was going to be coming eventually. I was on a call with an authenticity coach and they were like, listen, you know, obviously, you know, you've had this style for a while. It does work to a certain extent, but based off of like, you know, where you're going now, you're going to have a problem getting to where you want to go with how you're, you know, currently doing content. So they really encouraged me, you know, you're going to have to really show up. And by show up, that means like really showing your face. He's like, you know, one day, just do content. I remember the day when you like had your face and I was like, oh, okay. Like, I like this. Like, it was like fun. Like, I feel like I remember seeing that. Okay. But wait, <laughs> you ha you were talking about a coach. What is this deal? Like, what was, I mean, also, okay, the coach, but like, also you were talking about your goals with this. So maybe like, I don't know what came first. Did they help you with the goals? No. So I already like had like Goals. I was like, what ended up happening was I was realizing that like people were getting results from like what I'm saying. Imagine like what I can do if I really get in there and like help people. I, I really wanted to like help people on like on a deeper level. And they're just like, it's going to be tricky if you have this style of content, right? So I was feeling kind of lost in my content already. I was like, I know something's not resonating here. I'm also feeling bored, which again, anytime you're feeling bored, it's like time to change it up. So then, so, okay. So you were posting and you were feeling bored. You wanted to do more, help more people. How did you know to like look for a coach or like how did you even find this person? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Usually like you want to give yourself a chance to address something initially because no one understands your content like you do. But after a while, there's certain knowledge or mindset shifts that you just cannot make on your own. And I have, let's just talk about that. I have, a, I've had a lot of coaches. I had a lot of courses that I, like I, we can like get into that, that as well. But after a while, you know that there's just a change that you need to make um but you don't have either the skill set or knowledge to do that on your own it's like okay yeah sure i could try to figure this out on my own but it's like let me help do an expert and like get me there quicker same with like i'm like i could try to figure out like t buy 10 microphones and like figure out which one does best or just watch a youtube video and be like sure i'll do that one <laughs> what was the name justin schumann and then you just saw a video like tiktok recommended it okay i think his first video that really spoke to me was 
um, for creators with over 100k followers, um, why you feel so lost in your content? Because like, again, I'm, I didn't really grow this way, but like, for example, like if you didn't actually have a niche and you just sort of jumped on trends, like dancing trends, you could grow these like really, really huge accounts. Like I know some people with a million followers with just trending sounds, but like now things have changed. There's really no connection towards them. Right. So that, that was like that whole video, like why you feel so misaligned your content. And once I saw that, I was like, no, what? I feel this way. And that's what really spoke to me. And you like pay for a chat to write. How much was it? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what's pressed right now. It was like two ninety seven. Okay. I mean, I feel like that's kind of on par for like what other like courses, like experts. I see that. Yeah. Especially like what did, so then you get on the call and he's asking about like your goals, right? Or like what were some Um, of the things that he like gave you from that? For sure. So I actually filled out like a sheet in terms of like what I was like looking for. And during the call, I actually did not show my face. Right. So like when I got on the call, he was like, okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Like, I didn't say this with like showing your face and again it wasn't like calling me out so like you know he was he was just trying to like understand ultimately when you don't do something there's a reason for that right and like, i think the biggest thing was like because my content was getting pushed quite a bit on tiktok the idea of my face being out there with potentially getting thousands or millions of views was really unsettling for me i look at nail content like what i do here as being almost like my alter ego it's like so not what i ever thought i was gonna do i mean it is scary i know like there's a lot of like hate on TikTok. Like, yeah, in the beginning, I mean, yeah, it was just the nails. I think that is something that is unique to nail content is like just by the virtue of our content, like we don't really show our faces. So like that is also part why I'm trying to do this podcast is to like share my face, share my personality and like connect deeper with creators and our audiences. But I do love how you are showing because you do like the green screen TikTok effect. So like you'll be in the bottom screen and then you'll have your like, for people that haven't seen it, you'll have the like nail care video of your nails behind you and you're explaining it, which definitely TikTok strategy, I don't know, and we'll maybe if they gave you this too, but like showing your face catches people on TikTok more too. Definitely. In April, in May of this year, my content was just plummeting. When I say content underperforms, it's not that it's not getting as much views as it used to, is that I can see it's not resonating, right? So the engagement's going down, there's like less comments, it's like a more holistic thing. Then I got on another coaching call with her name is um Claire Liz. She's like really good at content that's really conversational and casual and really is native to a TikTok platform. But she was like, you know what? I love how you're showing your face, but you don't want your videos to look like a five minute craft video. Not that there's any shade in that, right? Those are the type of videos that can do really well, but they don't necessarily have long-term success because there's really no personality. So she was like, that's how it looks like to her. And you know, not to be rude, but she was like, you know, this is probably why you're losing people, right? I was like, okay, well, if my old style videos have a higher retention because that's what people are used to, and this newer style video was showing my face has a higher retention in the beginning, rather than doing one or the other, why don't I just combine them, right? And that's where this new style was sort of born. But like you're saying, like slowly introducing like new things, but having that old recognizable thing, I think that is a great tip if people are trying to transition into a new thing. And always like I always say like give it some time because when I first did my videos, it's not just that, you know, because like sometimes like when you switch things up, it's like, okay, I did this one thing, it didn't work once, let me show the X that out. But you have to give it a chance. A, for your audience to get used to it, but for you to get better at it. So then, I mean, you, I think we mentioned this before we started, but this is your full-time job right now. I mean, my income is basically probably, I don't know, 60, 70% content creation, or maybe like (laughs) half, I don't know. And then other like half is sponsored videos. And then like, I don't know, 1% is like affiliate. I feel like I'm so bad with like my affiliate marketing, which like, I don't know, I need to, whatever. But I'm curious because I feel like I don't see... I mean, a lot of it is just like nail polish watching for me because that's what I do. But I'm wondering like where your revenue is coming from, I guess, like what streams you have. You do see what I do outside the nail niche, so ed tech company. That's why I do I do work with one nail care company, mostly ed tech, but just one nail care company. With every industry, like, there is like a dominating content style. And I would say for the nail, mostly it is aesthetic. I think the education style, eh, it was really popular back in like 2014, 2015, but it just is not a dominating style. You see tons of reviews on YouTube. You see tons of like, you know, aesthetic stuff. And my education content, I love it. So I was like, you know what? This type of educational style, how I can communicate really clearly resonates more with 
ed tech companies. So I would make UGC ads for them. Wait, ed tech. So what is that? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> ed tech is like um, any sort of like tutorial, like uh, education. Like it could be like tutorial, like math tutoring, things like that. If the content you have is, I, like, I consider my content to be a bit more retro. Right. It, it might not necessarily be like what the briefs are looking for. See like where your content can resonate like outside the space. So for me, like I do like ed tech ads. Wait, so then how, so what does that, you're just kind of like study like um, with Chegg and like get like 15% off or like learn how to do math equations. <laughs> so the ads actually have to look native. Those are the ones that perform best. The more salesy you are, the worse they do. So it's more like, I noticed that when it comes to ads performing well, particularly in the tutorial space, make it clear that it solves a problem, right? So I wouldn't just be like, oh, you know, just get this discount. It's like, if you're struggling with this, then you need to try this, teach them, and then say, if you want to do this, then you go to this thing, right? So it's very, very much native. I feel like that definitely reflects now that you say this it like reflects in your content because a lot of it is like do you have brittle nails like let me solve this problem for you so but i'm also curious like how did you how do you get these jobs or like these commissions to like ugc because a lot of mine is like these nail polish companies see my videos and they're like oh we want that video like it, with our polishes like can you do it yeah. and I'm like sure but like how do these ed tech people know that they're like this nail polish girl can like make us a video about <laughs> have to like contextualize yourself outside of nails and do you know some cold pitching just because again they're not going to associate your content with that so you just like create a portfolio that shows how you create different you can create content with different products i wouldn't recommend being a jack of all trades like if you are really great at aesthetic content lead with that if you're really great at educational content like lead with that yes i built my social media page i know how to do that and i can do that for you right I'm like every time i talk to somebody i'm like that's another platform like youtube shorts i'm trying to get into like now it's just like another thing <laughs> and then now they're like well i could do outside my like now talking to you i'm like i should do outside my niche like <laughs> I would still recommend being focused. So I know some people are just like, do everything, but I feel like it's hard to be good at everything. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also, I was talking to Nell Betch, and like, we were just talking about like, trying to get outside of like, a niche, right? But it's so, it's hard. I mean, like the first videos you make in anything are not great, <laughs> just objectively. Like, you don't know what you're doing. Like, they're really long. Like, maybe they don't have that hook. Like, so trying to get outside the niche is difficult just because you're not used to making that content like i've made thousands of nail videos and that's why like now i'd be like boom 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 done I, i'm an ex like i got it <laughs> but like a vlog i'm like it's just like so hard i'm like how do i do a voice like what is the voiceover like it's boring i'm like what's happening here yeah i think with content in general like what i've learned i sort of call it like the harmonics of storytelling i think it's just about having constant points of like tension and release throughout your video for example you know you could be like if you want to do that you might think this but this will happen instead you want to do this and then you can like go from there i like that i feel like that i mean that's definitely like a staple in architecture too of like the compression and the release and like that is just creates that rhythm which like makes sense it's like do you are your nails breaking like what is happening and then you're like don't do that or like eh, you know and then like here it is so i feel like that is and that catches people right that's the hook yeah for sure i feel like education or like when people ask me questions i feel like it's a lot of pressure that i'm like i don't what if i don't know or like i don't say the right or you know like i'm like i don't know ask someone that like actually knows because like i don't i don't know about like actual nail health or like anything like gel allergies, like I just do my thing. Like I, you know, I am self-taught, but I wonder like how much, like if you deal with like that pressure or like how you deal with like trying to help people, if there is like this other layer to it. Yeah. So like ultimately, like I, this is something I definitely go to as I go through as well, but like when someone asks you a question, that means you have the ability to solve it, right? Even if there's someone with more information than you or who's quote unquote the expert, they're coming to you for a reason, right? Also, it depends on the type of problem. Like if it's just something like, oh, you know, nail breakage, et cetera, like that's what I deal with. Anything that's more on like the clinical, I actually have an allergy side, I don't really deal with. In fact, there's one thing for like struggling with nail breakage, but if we're talking about like something lifting from the nail plate and things that are more on the clinical intense side, then I you recommend you know, them talking to a doctor or something. I feel like that is a good, in the way of like what you're saying of like, if they're coming to you, like that is their way in. Like if you can help them with something like that is a start. And like you're saying, like, I'm not the, I'm not a doctor, like Dr. Dermatologist, but like, I'm a friend, I'm going to give you my opinion. Like, and that, I think a lot of people just need that also to like start that journey probably too, of like trying to learn about their like nail health. So 
Also, like when I started, I like I was definitely not the expert at all. People were asking me, and I decided to like help them out. I guess that's just like again, that's like sharing and like community. Going back to like you at MIT, like trying to make a community, like sharing your passion, like nail art, and now it's just developed into helping people with their nail health too. So I just like full circle for sure. But yeah, no, that that's how it happened. Do you still do nail art now, or is it just kind of like? I don't know. For me, it's like I don't really paint my nails for fun anymore. Now that's just like work where I'm like, after I worked, like, I don't want to do my nails again. Like, I just like leave on what I have. Yeah. So for the most part, I don't really, I only do like some nail art. If like I, if something that is like trending on Pinterest is aligned with something I happen to have. So I had, you know, Chrome, I had like some ombre stuff, et cetera. Like that's what I do there. But for the most part, I take things on and off. That's why I usually have it very like neutral. If there's like a new color that like really, you know, catches my attention, you know, I'll like wear that. It's really hard to be like, okay, let me film this day and then take off this color or glitter. It just is, it just can be a bit much. So then you're just, you're like natural, long, strong nails. Yeah, this is like my builder for this one, and it helps with uh, stop with like staining and things like that. And my nails like look better. And this one does not have builder, but this is my content hand. That's why if it wasn't for having a content hand, I would have builder on both hands. But this one has to be readily available. I feel like that is a thing of like nail creators where it's like we have so much nail polish, but then it's like I know a lot of people don't paint their nails like in between because they just want to be ready for like content. So it's just like <laughs> it's almost like the opposite of what you'd expect someone with this amount of nail polish is like never painting their nails. I definitely go around looking crazy, yeah. like, especially like when I like go out after Fridays, like one hand is red, the other one has nothing on it, or they're two different colors. I'm not going to take things on and all. Also, I always have my thumb like a different thing because I like will film something here, but then also here. So then it's just like everything is different. <laughs> Like, I do not know how to do it. Swatching content takes so long. But yeah, like, that's like part of like the crazy. Not me. I'm like, fifth, five minutes done. But that's what, that's what's so, like, sort of like tricky about it. Like, you would be like, oh, that's a 10 second video, but that's like not 10 seconds of work. That's why I don't really do swatching content. Yeah, but like, I think because you just probably haven't done it as much. Like, for me, it's like super fast. Where I'm like, if I was going to do like a voiceover or like, I don't know, I'd be like, oh, this is uh, so long. I could like to make a voiceover. It takes them like so many takes. I'm like, I don't know what I'm saying. Like, I have to figure that out. Like, then I like have to re-edit it because like I didn't, I didn't pre-plan the voiceover with the video. So then I re- you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah, I think it's just, like, what you end up doing the most is what you're good at. Because I'm, like, a whole swatch, I can do, like, well, just, like, a one thumb, like, 15 minutes done. And that would take me an hour and a half. Like, what? what? I would be messing it up because, like, I'll, like, and, like, the polish would, like, spill into my cuticle. It would be such a mess and all that. Yeah, thing. I mean, that's that's always the struggle, just, like, getting that. But I don't know. Do you, are you you're using, like, a macro lens or something clip-on or no? On your phone? <laughs> No, I keep it oh. based. I it's just your regular. What phone do you have? It's like I believe it's a ten. Like I got. Okay, I have the ten. I use the ten for fo- filming. Yeah, so like my setup is so basic. Like it's like a light box, and then like it's like a really long tripod. What do you use for the ed tech videos? You're in it. Like your face is in it. Are you like trying? Are you using that light box like turned around, or it's just like whatever? Oh no, I'm actually like outside of the box, but because it's ed tech and it's focusing on like the Gen Z audience, like you really don't have it. It, it can be a little bit like grunge. Yeah, a little bit grunge. It doesn't have to be super aesthetic. So then are you figuring out the voiceover before you film something? So you know like what clips and like you understand like, oh, I have to get a clip of my, I mean, right? Yeah, so what I do um, is because I do so much educational content and it's really easy for like my thoughts to be jumbled. I actually have a, a Notion template where I just brain dump all week. And then usually by like, Friday, which is like when I film, I already have an outline of like what needs to be done. And then on like Saturday, I do voiceovers and you know, I send things over to like an editor. I not get editing at all. For your nail content? Yeah, yeah. You have an editor. Yeah, I'm really bad at editing. So like if you do not like editing, definitely get an editor. How did you find this editor? So I know another content creator <laughs> who's like in like the lifestyle niche and this was like her editor. So how how much is it? <laughs> so for like editing, for like because of my video style, like I could like editing videos, it can be for me 10 to $15 a video. Um, sometimes if your stuff is a bit more advanced like if you have like the alex Ramosi style type thing that's like 18 20 sometimes 30 dollars but it depends on like your videos but i only like make like around like 
between three to five videos a week, but considering that I'm so inefficient at it, like before, it would take me six hours to edit three videos because it's the voiceover. <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's the voiceover. It's, you know, trying to like organize a visual. I feel like visual and voiceover are like two completely different things. So now I just send it like to like an editor and it. So then what are you, you send them like the stop, the like background footage, then you just send them a regular video of you speaking the voiceover? I upload all the clips and then the audio, and then, you know, then I'd give them like, the captions so they'd see the structure. Usually the first time you do it, it does, you know, take some time, obviously, for your editor to get used to it, just because it's a different space, but that's, like, our, like, style, so, yeah. I, I like editing. Like, that is, like, I feel like also that is a lot of times where it's, like, I find the angle or, like, the creativity of, like, painting my nail the same time every video it's like okay but how do you edit it like what is the like the story there but i was look, looking at editors to try i was like maybe i don't know trying to do like clips for the podcast or like i was looking at someone on fiverr and they were like oh well are you gonna send me like the timestamp of like when you want the clip and i'm like no like that would that's the whole job like if i could figure out the timestamp, then all i would do would just crop it vertical that's the clip like <laughs> like i think considering the amount of time it would take to do that, it's just better for me because I'm not efficient at it. I don't enjoy doing that. So that's that. But again, if you genuinely enjoy doing it, for example, I would not have someone write my emails or my blog just because I genuinely love doing that. Getting up. Okay. You can you can write emails for me and I can edit for you. <laughs> well, thank you again for being here. Everyone follow Parabelle Beauty everywhere. No, well, thanks so much, Amy. And I'm so, I like I but I, I always say, like, you find people you're aligned with. Like, I had, like, I mean, I knew you had, like, an architectural background. I did not know that we were, like, so similar and, like, in, like, this sense, which is always cool. And I would love to see more of your cat because, like, oh, my God, so cute. Like, I was like, oh, my God. Like, where did you find that costume? The moon cat team sent it to me. They were like, we have an idea. Okay, because I was like, where? I was like, it's one thing to find a costume, but to find a costume that specific, I was like, where did you get that? Okay, cool. Yeah, it was like, I think it was, it was like a Disney branded like costume for dogs. I like, I was like, oh yeah, like I was in New York, so I like didn't have him with me. And they're like, what size? And I was like, I think small is fine. Like if it's for a dog. And then like I got it, and I was like, I like wrote back. I was like, guys, we need a large. Like <laughs> he's not, he's my, he's not my little kitten anymore. <laughs> He's a big boy. <laughs> it's like really cool to like do like cats of the nail content world because I noticed that nails and cats are like a thing. Like I mean, I don't have a cat, but I was like, so many of you guys have cats. Like I feel there are a lot of cats. That's what I'm like. I was like trying to like convince Michelle from Moon Cat. I was like, we need like a cats of Moon Cat collection. <laughs> yeah, no, this has been a pleasure, and I absolutely you know, love talking to you. Okay, I feel like Ash is a great example of just putting one step in front of the other and following the path that's being laid out for you. Like most of us in the nail world, this was never our idea of what we'd be doing, but somehow we got lucky enough to be here and create content online for people's entertainment and education. I appreciate Ash having that analytical self-reflection on her content and her platforms. I know I definitely overthink and self criticize but again that's how you learn that's how you improve and also her willingness to seek out help from other people again creating content online can feel lonely and like you're in it by yourself but you're not ask a friend ask a coach ask a <laughs> listen to nail bay pod if you've been following along my Instagram lately, you've noticed I've been putting some of these tips from our past guest into practice. I started one of my recent TikToks with your comment, maybe try it, and it worked. It has over 400,000 views, which for my TikTok lately is great. <laughs> I was happy about it. That was a hot tip from the greater good, Elizabeth. I applied liquid latex on my nails and dabbed on some gradient as Anna E recommended. And that video is popping off on YouTube shorts, trying to get to that 3 million views to get monetized. <laughs> It's at like 100,000. <laughs> so we have a ways to go. And of course, I've been implementing my slow zoom that Base Coat Stories Jasmine taught us all how to do in her episode. It's definitely becoming a favorite. These nail babes, they have the tips and tricks. So put some of these ideas to use. Tag us. 
me, Nail Babe, Abe, and <laughs> the guest who gives you an idea to let's share information. Again, I feel like this is like the water cooler or like the lounge, the back of the back room, the stock room. <laughs> where all the retail employees gossip about the Karens. So comment down below if you're using any of the tips and tricks you've learned on Nail Babe Pot or just enjoying. Not everything has to be about learning. We can just have fun and chat. And now for some comments. Nerdy Wordy Nails says, this was a fantastic convo. This is the Ani E episode. I love how natural each conversation is and I've learned a ton from the episodes you put out so far. Okay, it's like I planned this comment. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but thank you. I'm glad you're learning. And thank you again to all the guests for being so open and willing to share. Nails by Maja99 says, I've been binging the pod all day today after finally finishing my master's thesis. Okay, congratulations, first of all. <laughs> I don't know where your priorities were, though. I think Nail Babe Pod comes up. Above master's thesis we're gonna need to work that one out but i'll let it slide this time so leave me a comment and maybe i'll read it on air next time make sure you subscribe to abe.nailbabe on youtube follow parabell beauty everywhere and i'll see you next thursday